Thanks everyone. I'm so excited to be here. This is like a kind of, I don't know, it's like a pilgrimage, isn't it, this place? I mean, just all this, to be surrounded by all this amazing uh, old computing gear. I don't know, I don't know how you feel about it, but this is kind of, I'm a little bit moved, to be honest. Um, <laughs> You'll see that my work involves quite a lot of games, actually, so it couldn't really be more relevant. Um, but I describe myself as a digital artist, which is one of those sort of um, vague kind of uh, terms. I can't really think of a better way to describe me. Uh, at one point, I was saying, oh, I'm a digital consultant or creative coder or whatever, or that awful thing, uh, what is it, creative technologist? Any creative technologists in the room today? <laughs> I really hate that term. Um, so I thought, you know, sod it, I'm just gonna say I'm an artist. And actually, that does make a bit of sense because I do quite a lot of random things and, uh, and people didn't really understand why I would do all these random things. And then I say, well, I'm an artist. And they go, oh, <laughs> That's, that explains it. Right, so I'm gonna talk through some of my projects tonight um, and do a bit of, uh, some demos, so, um, some coding demos. You see we've got this Commodore 64, which the guys here kindly set up for me. I'm gonna do some programming on that later. <laughs> yeah, I know, it's pretty exciting. Um, <laughs> but first of all, I'm gonna talk about Pixel Pyros, which is a huge project that I worked on mostly last year and the year before last. It's a big interactive fireworks display that uses these massive projectors to project computer-generated fireworks onto this really big screen, uh, and every firework is triggered by a member of the audience. Now, I did it the first time uh, two years ago, uh, and then last year I, I applied for an Arts Council grant to take it on tour and to add lasers, right? Because obviously lasers just make everything like at least a million times better, right? Yeah, like I've even brought one today, look. Yeah, I know, already you're excited. Um, so anyway, before I could use lasers, I had to learn how to, how to program them. Uh, so I bought one. Um, it's a one watt laser that I bought. It was about 2,000 quid, uh, a one watt RGB laser. One watt, it doesn't sound very bright, does it? Um, but when you think that this one, I think, is half a milliwatt, something like that. So my laser is 2,000 times brighter than this. Um, Oh, this is the screen that we used. It's rigged on scissorless. I thought I was going straight to the laser bit. Obviously, no idea what I'm talking about. Um, but you can see the screen there. It's 18 by 12 meters. It's really massive, and it's rigged on these, uh, yeah, these huge extending platforms. Here we are. Here's the, here's the laser bit. All right, so this was me doing some tests. Uh, you can hear the laser clicking away in the background. It just The laser has little mirrors on it, which... Um, which is what moves the laser around. And you see all these little spots of really bright light. I wanted to see if I could make like little spots of sparkly particles with a single laser. And so that's what this is. It was the first test and I thought, well, that works quite well. It's actually the laser is moving in between each dot. You can see here, I'm leaving the laser on in between the dots. So you can see I have to move it one place, turn it on, turn it off again, move it to the next place. And it can move so fast that you just see it as individual dots. But this was just my uh, one watt laser. The laser that we were using on tour is actually 11 watts. I'm just gonna turn this down. You don't need to hear me muttering in the background. Um, so this was the first time we used the 11 watt laser, which was, you can't really see it from this video, but it was so bright. I don't, you can sort of see the reflections on the table. It was just lighting up the entire room with this massive, uh, bright, gorgeous laser. It was so much better than the one that I was using. So these lasers, I think, are worth about 30 grand each. Uh, and they're, they're sort of disappointingly small. They're like this big. It's like, oh, it should be bigger, right? <laughs> For 30 grand, it should be bigger. Uh, apparently 10 or 20 years ago, they were the size of a small car and they had lots of water cooling equipment and stuff like that. Now they've really got small, but they're still super cool. Um, so this is the, the, uh, the project in action. This is the Brighton event. We took it uh, on five dates around the country. Uh, the Brighton date eventually ended up indoors. 
Um, but you can see here some photos of the laser. You can see how bright it is. So it has the projector as well, but the laser is like bringing out the really bright spots. Ah, so how does it work? Well, there are these, uh, I wonder if you can see it in the previous one. Uh, you can just about see there are these white dots along the bottom of the screen. So those are the interactive elements. They're projected onto the screen. And when you move your hand in front of them, that triggers a firework. It's actually a really simple system. It just uses a single infrared camera and uh, infrared lights behind the screen. So I can just sort of look at those spots and see if any motion happens there. And if it does, then I can trigger off a firework. This was the first event on our tour in Nottingham. And you can see that it's, a really, it's really crap, right? It's, it almost didn't work. I mean, it was so stressful. I had to really ride the controls and make it. Just, we just about got away with it, right? Um, but the problem is, is that the infrared lights we were using then, uh, they were kind of, they weren't strong enough. And you can see that as the wind blows the, the screen around, like the shadows happen and, uh, yeah, it was just, and there's a lot of noise because the, the lights aren't particularly bright. So we thought, oh my God, we've got to fix this. And we only had two weeks to the next event. So uh, I did what any normal person would do. And that is, I ordered uh, 40 meters of infrared LED strips off the internet. <laughs> uh, you can see it there on the left. That's what it looks like in normal light. Yeah. And this is what it's like in an infrared camera. It's like so bright. It was amazing. Uh, so we thought, yep, this is it. We can make better lights out of these. Um, frantically waterproofed them and found power supplies for them. So now what we see in our camera is this. So every vertical light uh, represents one of the, uh, the sort of lights that you touch. Uh, and it's a much, much clearer, more distinct image. So here's a video of the first date of our tour in Nottingham. Um, yeah, I guess I can talk you through it. Oh, it's for Game City, right, which is a gaming culture festival. That's one of the projectors. We had two of those, 15,000 watts each. There's, uh, there's the infrared cameras. We've always got a backup camera. That's Becky, the production manager. That's how we rigged the screen up. It's literally just cable ties around the top of these scissor lifts. And then all the scissor lifts, we raise them up at the same time. That's the laser, he's adjusting the laser there. You've got to be really careful with these lasers because they can really properly blind you. Um, we have like a thick document of health and safety uh, that we have to send to the council before. And the show runs about 30 minutes and each section of the show is a different style. So we start off with some sort of ordinary looking fireworks and then this one is more like vector graphics like Tron style and it uses a different piece of music there. Uh, and then there's later like low resolution 8-bit versions of the fireworks um, and then more like these, these are the low bit ZX Spectrum style. <laughs> so it's slightly higher frame rate than on a ZX Spectrum. Um, and yeah, and then slowly we have like more realistic looking fireworks as well. We make people queue up and, uh, and then they get their chance. Oh, because it was Game City, I added a couple of games. So it made the biggest uh, game of Space Invaders ever. I think there's about a million Space Invaders. Because obviously there's like 30 people playing it. You've got to make it a bit more difficult. And um, we also did Asteroids as well. Any project I do now, you just got to add a game, right? That's like the most important part of your project. Um, the game is always the most exciting part of the project. You can spend all your time making beautiful fireworks. As soon as Space Invaders comes on, everyone's like, whoa, oh my God, it's Space Invaders. So, you know, that's my advice, just always add a game. I only spent like a day making those games as well. Like the project was months of work. So like, oh, I'll just add Space Invaders. Everyone's like, oh, my favorite bit was Space Invaders. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know if you can just about make out the laser flashes as uh, the, the fireworks explode. It doesn't always come out on video very well because it's, um, it's constantly scanning. So if it's out of sync with the camera, it's uh, a bit tricky to capture. But yeah, I made these big flashes of laser when they exploded. And as the tour progressed, this was the first date on our tour, but as the tour progressed, I just used more and more lasers until by the end it was like loads of lasers. Oh, Laser Arcade. So this is another project. <laughs> 
So, but this was a project that I did in February. It was a short project. It was only a couple of weeks. And because I'd learned how to use lasers last year, I was like, OK, well, I've got to use this knowledge to make more laser stuff. Um, and it was for a, a, an artist residency in Margate. And Margate, as you might know, is, is kind of has faded glamour. It used to be uh, a very exciting, beautiful, sophisticated resort. I, you're laughing, but it did. Like in the 30s to the 50s, it was heyday. It's beautiful tea rooms and stuff. I mean, I went to Margate in the 80s, right? And it was a bit shit then, but at least the fairground was still running. Um, and it finally closed, I think, in 2005. And now the fairground is just uh, completely dilapidated. You can see it here. That's like, that's a listed building that um, that roller coaster was built in the early 20th century. So it's like real classic building. All the rest of the theme park has been uh, taken down, but they're actually turning it back into a theme park museum and getting all the old rides from all over the world and putting it and hopefully earning, own, opening this year. So I wanted to make a game that was reminiscent of the old slideshows, you know, like the shooting galleries, the coconut shies and stuff. So I bought a gun. Um, it's, it's actually a BB gun, right? This is an airsoft gun. Do you know airsoft? Yeah, some of you do. So the airsoft are plastic bullets designed to be able to shoot people with. Uh, <laughs> It still really hurts, uh, just so you know. Um, and I bought this one, which actually, frankly, is terrifying. It was about 130 quid or something. It was really expensive. Uh, and it was rubbish. It just didn't work at all. Um, so I took it back and got a smaller one. Uh, I was much happier with this. It's a springer. It runs on a spring-loaded mechanism. In the end, I couldn't use them because I was firing at like a board, and they just come straight back at you, right? <laughs> when you fire them at the wall, it just comes right back, and it hits you in the face. Um, and it's bad enough, the danger of being blinded with the laser, right? Let alone if there's little pellets coming into your face. Um, in the end, I ended up using Nerf guns. But my idea was, was that I could make a, a shooting gallery with like laser projected targets, right? So you'd shoot real things and eventually it became Nerf bullets in, at like computer projected targets. So my biggest challenge was figuring out where the bullet hit the, the board, right? I ended up with a board that was about two and a half by one and a half meters wide, pretty big. Um, so how do you know where the bullet hits? How, how would you do it? What's that? More lasers. More lasers. <laughs> I, like the, I like where you're going with that. Um, there, there is a way to use infrared lasers, actually. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen people that make their own kind of uh, touch screens, the big touch screens. And what you can do is make a laser plane, right? It's an infrared laser plane. Uh, you can get these special lenses that you stick on lasers that instead of like, you know, this laser is a little point. Uh, you can get a lens and put it on the laser and it makes it come out in a flat line, right? You've seen like laser levels, yeah? So you can actually get these laser plane lasers and stick them in like the corners of a, like a touch screen. And then when you touch them, your fingers light up. Yeah, because the infrared laser is lighting up the surrounds of your fingers. Um, and if you've got an, um, an infrared camera underneath, then you can see where the touches are. So I was experimenting with that, and I got some of these infrared lasers, but they were really low power. Um, I ordered some really high power ones from America, thinking that if I made this laser plane, as the Nerf bullet crossed this plane, it would light up. It might get a flash of light in my camera. Um, unfortunately, there was all the storms in America in February, and they didn't come in time, which is lucky, though, because I had always had this other plan in my head, which is the most stupid plan ever, and I never expected it to work, and that's why I was using the infrared laser plan. But in the end, I used, I used my ridiculous, stupid plan, and the stupid, crazy plan is to use sound, right? So my friend Jason, he made this... Um, ping pong table and when the ping pong ball hit the table he used the system of microphones and he measured the amount of time that it took for each uh, microphone to get the sound and obviously there were tiny differences in that so you could reverse calculate uh, this system this math system called multilateration which is incredibly complicated there's the maths for it um, I'm not very good at maths uh, I got my friend Paul to help me implement this but actually uh, it didn't work, right? It was rubbish. 
it seems like it should work, right? And it will work, this maths. It's actually quite, it looks scary, right? I don't understand mathematical notation, so it looks really scary. Quite good at maths with programming maths, but I don't understand this. When you turn this into code, it's actually not that much code. It's like, huh, why are you writing it like that? And it's just, <laughs> <laughs> anyways, but I was never very good at maths. Um, yeah, but it didn't work because obviously, oh man, it's so hard to get the sound wave because like the sound wave hits the microphone and you see this wave and it's like, well, it's sometimes a bit noisy and they sometimes get a bit sort of mashed up. I think maybe it goes through the board a bit faster than it goes through the air and you're getting all these weird ghosty things. So it's not always clear when the sound actually starts. So you, basically what I'm explaining is that you've got inaccurate data. And if there's the slightest bit of inaccuracy with this system, it just goes way out, it's crazy. In the end, I used a, a sort of simpler version that simulated springs to kind of calculate where the, the sound was coming from. And that was much more uh, resilient to errors. Like if one microphone was a little inaccurate, the others could kind of make up for it. Anyway, here's what it looks like. So we basically spent the whole weekend uh, picking up Nerf bullets. Uh, so, you know, on my hands and knees, basically picking them up. But you can see there, um, you're firing at this target. Again, this was like the game, the simplest game, this like target that I've got there. But I made other games that shooting ducks, or green bottles, I even made asteroids, I think. Obviously, you've got to add asteroids, right? Um, but the most popular one was just this target, right? Because by accident, I'd created this really cool sort of playability to it because it was really hard to get the center. And if you got the center, you got 50 points. So you're likely to win if you got the center. It was a bit like um, the Harry Potter game, right? If you catch the snitch. I, also, why do they even bother with the rest of the game, right? Because you, like, you win the game if you catch the snitch. They should just all hang around on their broomsticks waiting for the snitch, right? Anyway, um, <laughs> if you get the center one, you get 50 points and that's like the best score. I think if you get the middle ring, it's 10 points and the outside ring, it's five points. So everyone was totally addicted to this game. Um, and I was like, do you want to play maybe asteroids? And they're like, target practice. So like, okay, fine. Let's, let's move on, what's next? Oh, so Smashing Conference. There's, uh, uh, it's a web design conference. You know Smashing Magazine, right? You're web designers, aren't you? I think, some of you, web, you're webby people. No one's prepared to admit it, I understand. <laughs> I don't know, I didn't think it was that bad, but fine. Um, I won't tell anyone, it's, it's good. Um, so Smashing Magazine, make a conference. This was in Oxford, they just wanted a cool intro. I said, can I bring a laser? And they were like, yeah, sure, because uh, I'd learned how to use lasers. I think I mentioned that. Um, and so it was quite an interesting chance to actually just make something with a laser. I don't usually do things like this that are linear. I usually do things that are interactive, but. Uh, yeah, like I said, I was just experimenting with the laser. So you can just see there, that's the building we were working with. It's, it's the Oxford Town Hall. Um, and I was just going to sort of just make shapes on this building, but I went to visit it. It was only like, by this point, it was a couple of weeks before, I think. I'd already started the preparation work, and I was just going to do shapes. But when I saw the building in, for real, I was like, yeah, I've got to work with that architecture. Um, but it was a surprise. Um, to the audience because they just thought they were getting like an animation at the start of the conference. Um, and then, so this is what they were getting, this little animation on the screen. And they're like, oh yeah, this is nice, whatever. And then the laser breaks out of the screen. And I thought, really, I just had to map the pipe organ with lasers? I don't, I don't really see that that was a choice, right? It's what you would have done, right? It's like, I've got a pipe organ, I've got a laser, let's make the pipe organ into a rainbow-colored graphical equalizer. Yeah, you would, right? It's, I don't feel like that was one of my most inspired creative moments. Oh, I actually mapped that whole dome in 3D, so um, I could push the laser shapes in 3D and map it around the the edge of the dome. Oh, I took ages to do that, it was really hard. I nearly gave up, but I just about managed to sort of map this sort of fake version of the 
dome in my 3D space and made it work with this. Yeah, it was pretty complicated. Mapping the, the pipe organ was just like, I had handles at the top and the bottom of every single one of these lines. And the only way I could do it is by pointing the laser at the pipe organ and then adjusting the top and the bottom of each one. It took about half an hour. And because the laser's quite flickery, I just had such a headache. It was like mental. And of course, by this point, I'd learned how to do laser particles. So I was just like, yeah, laser particles everywhere. <laughs> and yeah, sound responsive stuff is not something I've done much of. So it was all a bit experimental. I think I prefer things where the audience are involved. I did actually, as part of this conference, do uh, a, a laser flappy bird. Right, so uh, I laser projected Flappy Bird onto the dome, and then the bird would fly up higher the more applause there was, right? So it was uh, audience control. I'd do anything for applause. Um, <laughs> so the, more, the louder it was like a clapometer, and the louder the applause was, the higher the Flappy Bird was. Um, cool, so I move on to Lunar Trails. Lunar Trails is super relevant because it's all based around the 1979 game Lunar Lander. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, there isn't one in this building, um, but I might be able to fix that because this Lunar Lander cabinet is actually mine. <laughs> yeah, I, I bought it off eBay. Uh, it was $1,000. I've still never seen it. I think I bought it about two or three years ago. It's still in LA. Um, <laughs> <laughs> How do you get an arcade cabinet from LA to England? It's really expensive and really difficult if you go through normal channels and I don't have the time or energy to think of creative, unusual channels to get it back to England. But anyway, this is mine. Uh, my friends in LA are looking after it. It's in their office. Uh, apparently, they, they enjoy it, which is good enough for me. Uh, I love this game. I made a version of it in Flash a long time ago, and now I've recently made a version of it in JavaScript. JavaScript. It's very popular. Seems to be the top hit on Google if you search for Lunar Lander. Thankfully, Atari haven't given me a season to assist. Uh, like all my other friends who have made these games. Uh, my friend, I got a friend, Paul Neve, he made Pac-Man and Space Invaders and Asteroids, and he got imme you know, immediately taken down. I would be super annoyed if Atari tell me to take this down. Um, not because of any, not because, you know, not because of any normal reason, but mainly because they've put a version of Lunar Lander on the internet, and it is so rubbish. It's not at all like the original. I was painstakingly recreated the original. You can even play it on your mobile device um, if you want. Oh, do it now if you want. Moonlander.seb.ly. Uh, crack it open and, and have a little play. Um, I'll show you it running as well if I can. Uh, oh. If I can open my browser. Oh, look at that. I'll talk about that in a minute. But let's, let's do this. Right, so this is the game. Uh, if, if you haven't seen it, the object is to land your uh, spaceship, your lunar module, on the, on the surface of the moon. It's a fiendishly difficult game, um, mostly because your thrusters are rubbish. They almost do nothing. So uh, by the time you realize you're about to crash, it's probably a bit too late. That's why I love it, right? Because it's really slow, and you're like, oh, I'm just floating around on the moon. And then suddenly it's like, oh my god, oh my god, I'm going to crash. Um, I'm reasonably good at it now. Uh, obviously, I've been testing it quite a lot. Come on. There you go. Yeah? Oh, thank you. OK, so what uh, you might not realize is while you're playing it, I am actually spying on you uh, because you're transmitting your core. This is all the people playing this game right now on the internet. Um, and they're transmitting their coordinates to my server so I can watch them play. Uh, this was actually the first step in an experiment to make a multiplayer Lunar Lander game. But um, in order to sort of smooth out the data and see what it looked like, I left a little very faint trail behind the people as they play it. Um, and the trail was so beautiful, over a few hours it built up into these beautiful explosions of light and colour that I never got any further with the multiplayer version of the game. I just ended up doing art instead. Um, there's an, a secret feature to this. If you open the JavaScript uh, uh, console, you can actually see where these people are playing the game. London, San Francisco, Manchester. 
I'm, I wanted to make like a proper data viz program with it, with like all little data about who, where they were and what their score was and how many times they'd played it and all this stuff. But again, I just haven't got quite got around to it yet. So yeah, I, um, I left it running the first time overnight. I ended up with something like this. And I just thought, wow, that's so beautiful. Um, so I always had in mind uh, that I wanted to somehow bring this into real life with like a, a proper arcade cabinet and uh, a big, like some sort of drawing machine. Oh, there's the arcade cabinet that I bought. Obviously, I couldn't use the original. It was stuck in LA. So I bought one. You can buy them flat pack off the internet. Uh, and, and obviously, I had to sort of manually make the control panel. These thrust controls uh, aren't generic. I had to kind of, um, I had to do metal work. <laughs> it was, look at that. Was, look. I added a spring and all kinds of stuff. It was brilliant. For a software guy, that's quite exciting. I, I, um, so there's the control panel. Oh, and there it is. There's the, uh, uh, my, my version of Luna Lander. It's actually running a full screen um, browser. It's just running Chrome, right? And uh, I'm converting all the buttons to key presses through an Arduino. Lots of ways you can do that, but I thought I might as well stick with that. Um, here's some kids playing it in Dublin the first time it was installed. But how do I make a big plotter? How do I make a big drawing machine? Well, there's this open source project called Polygraph by Sandy Noble. You can buy a kit. Uh, so I thought, well, I'll just use one of these kits. Uh, I think it does about a meter or two wide. But I wanted mine to be three meters wide, obviously, because everything has to be bigger. Um, and by the time I scaled it up to three meters, it was kind of pretty jerky because it was using stepper motors, which vibrate. I could talk forever about motors. I must stop myself <laughs> or we'll never be leaving. But if you want to talk about motors afterwards, come, I will bore you to death. It'll be brilliant. Um, but this is Sandy's machine. Uh, I just put through like a picture of the Apollo 11 um, photo. He, Sandy invented this really beautiful sort of rendering style. Um, which sort of takes advantage of the way that the, the pen swings off each corner, uh, which is really nice. I experimented with loads of pens, uh, spent 100 quid on pens, ended up using silver Sharpies. This is the original motor units. Um, I'm working with an engineer called Paul Strotten, who is an expert on motors. This is why I'm so boring about motors now, because he taught me all this brilliant stuff. He, he did some amazing engineering on this project, actually, which I can't even begin to go into, or I'll just be here all day. This is the first test of our new three meter wide uh, plotter. Look at that, it's drawing a line. Oh my God, it's amazing. Look at this. It's pretty exciting. But see how smooth that motion is? Yeah, because that's, that's DC servo motors. It's not, it's not a stepper motor. And I don't know why I'm showing you this. Um, that's the motor unit. I could talk about that. That's the install in Dublin. So there you go. That's kind of the final um, machine hanging up. Uh, that's the software that controls it. There you go. Over time, uh, I ended up using, did I say I use Silver Sharpie now? So it's, it looks really cool as the layers build up. Um, oh, and I also do little versions as well. This is a plot. Have you got any plotters like this? Yeah? They're so cool, aren't they? I've got two now. <laughs> um, uh, but I had to sort of write my own software to, to write to it. Um, but yeah, so I've got a few of these sort of A3 prints that I keep meaning to sell. I just haven't got around to it. Selling stuff is hard, isn't it? You've got to put it, take pictures and stick it on the internet and stuff. Um, yeah, here's a video.
drives me nuts when the kid grabs it. It's like, what? <laughs> Let go, you could really hurt yourself. <laughs> OK, cool, that's, that's Luna Trails. Ah, oh, Commodore Pets. Why am I showing you the Commodore Pets? I think probably that was the first computer that I got my hands on, I think. My dad was a physics lecturer, so he'd bring them home uh, in the holidays and I'd get to play with them. It's brilliant. It's great. Uh, co computers in those days had an attitude, right? Like now, it's like, oh, what would you like to do? A big start button or whatever it is. I don't, I don't know, modern computers. What are they like? Uh, but back then, it was just like this blinking cursor. To me, that cursor was just saying, what? I, so unfriendly, weren't they, computers? Then you type something, a mistake. Like, well, I just type, hello, mistake. Oh, <laughs> charming. Um, but computers were quite cool then, in, a, in some ways, because you had to learn to program, right? You couldn't, there was no choice. Like these days, it's like, oh, should I learn to program or should I just play with Photoshop? Like back then, you had to learn to program, really. It's like you well, you could get software in games, I suppose, but they took so long to load, you might as well have programmed it yourself. Um, I just always wanted to make graphics. I just wanted to draw pictures. So that's why I learned to program. Uh, oh, it's Commodore 64. Well, uh, Commodore 64 is pretty cool. In fact, I was, I was going to do some programming on the Commodore 64. See, we've actually got a Commodore 64 here. Thank you to the computer museum, that's pretty exciting. Can you see the TV? Yeah? All right, how am I gonna do this? Oh, I'm actually not used to typing on a Commodore 64 at all. The keys are all in weird places. But let's see what happens. Oh. Right, so I'm gonna do some computer art on the Commodore 64, yeah? Some digital art in two lines of code. Yeah. Oh, let's see what happens. OK, so 10 prints. Where's the inverted commas? There it goes. Hello. <laughs> yeah, you've done this before, right? Oh, 20 go to. It's pretty advanced, right? Yeah, it's pretty advanced stuff. Actually, you know what someone did earlier, which was really cool? was uh, on the BBC Micro outside. I saw someone had done... Yeah? Does anyone know what the hell that means? Yeah? The Karanji? No? There you go. Yeah, pretty cool. I can tell you're excited. Yeah? Yeah, we all did this, right? It's programming. Now, where's the run... Oh, there is run start. I never had a Commodore 64. This is uh, new to me. Right. Uh, now, how do I go up? Oh, shift. There you go. Right, so if I want to change something, I can just actually <laughs> move the cursor there. There you go. You don't need IDEs, do you? You can just do this. Move the cursor, type something new, semicolon. So semicolon, do you know what that does? Obviously, you all do, don't you? Yeah? It just takes away the line break, right? So it doesn't do a line break anymore. It just goes on to the next... Uh, bit. Right. Oh, it's really hard to use these cursor keys. <laughs> now, what if instead of typing some text, we want to type a character? You guys must know how to do that. Where is the delete key? I'm guessing it's that one. <laughs> oh, computers were weird. <laughs> um, I can use chr dollar to do a character. And on the Commodore 64, it had an extended character set. And if I do, like, character 205, it is a, uh, it's like a, a weird sort of slash. It's not an actual uh, slash. It's like a graphical line going from the, the, it's crossing the entire character, yeah? So you can see it joins up. So, can I just do list 10? Does that work? Yeah, it does. It's all coming back to me, it's brilliant. Um, so I can actually, like, if I do 205.5, it will just round down, right, to 205. But the reason I can do that is if I add then, where's the add, there it is. Uh, if I add RND1, RND1 returns a floating point number between zero and one. So if I add that to 205.5, it's either gonna be rounded down to 205 or 206, right? 
It's pretty complicated. Now if I run it. Yeah? Now you're probably all thinking right now, oh my god, this guy is such an amazing computer artist. Uh, I know you are, right? So you don't have to laugh. I know he's just shy. Um, but actually, the thing that you might not know is that that bit of code came in the Commodore 64 user manual. You know, so back then, doing art with your computer was just a fun thing to do. Whereas now, you've got to be all clever and be like, oh, I'm a digital artist. Um, there is actually, this, this piece of code has become famous. Uh, there's, there's been a book written about it. Uh, the book is called 10 print CHR dollar brackets 205.5 plus R&D brackets <laughs> 1, close bracket, close bracket, semicolon, colon, go to 10. Uh, you can buy it from Amazon. It's such a good book. Um, no, I'm not joking. That's me being genuinely sincere. It's really interesting because it talks about this history of computing and how things have changed. You know, over the last few years, it's not been very easy to do programming on a computer. It's getting a bit better now with JavaScript and stuff like that. But back then, you would have to learn to program. And no one thought twice about having some generative art in your user manual. Um, so check out the book. And also in that book, they uh, commissioned a lot of modern digital artists to do their homage to this uh, this program, so they would use either processing or another modern language to do their own graphical version of this alternating shape to create something else. Uh, it's a really, really interesting book. I recommend it highly. Right, so now I suppose we better go back to boring modern computers, although they do have more colors. They've got all the colors now. It's amazing. Sometimes you just have to remind yourself how amazing it is that you've got all the colors. Don't you think? It's like, which color do you want? I can have any color. Which one? Pick one. It's too hard to choose, right? Because there's too many. All right. Um, yeah, I no. I'm going to do some live coding in JavaScript now, just to prove how difficult it is to pick a color. Um, I'm just going to open this in Chrome. So I'm cheating a bit. I've got some code already. Yeah, you can see it there, some code. I'm basically making a canvas element and sticking it in my doc. You're, you do HTML, don't you? Yeah, it's pretty easy, isn't it? I'm just making a canvas element. Uh, I've got some random functions here. I don't usually do this. Usually, I start from nothing. But I just thought you'd be bored if I typed all that in. So I'm cheating today. So let's draw something. First thing we do before we draw something, pick a color. Pink. pink. What sort of pink? Like a fuchsia or like a? Hot pink or magenta. Maybe magenta is good. That's, that's a good, it's a classic, isn't it, magenta? A good classic 8-bit color. Um, Phil Star, God, it's actually, you know what? It's been ages since I've done JavaScript. <laughs> I've forgotten how to do it almost. Right, so I'm setting, so the canvas context is what I do all the graphics in. So I can draw a shape, any shape. What shape should I draw? Any shape? What's that? Any, any shape at all? Rectangle? <laughs> all right, rectangle. Let's do uh, a rectangle. With a rectangle, it's like the top left position and a width and a height. So let's draw a rectangle. Let's have a look. There it is. Yeah? Pretty. Can you see that there? Oh, it's off the screen. Oh, look, my. Oh. All right, let's, uh, let's fix that. Let's move it down a bit. down and along. Ugh, see, you, this is good. It's worth waiting for. Yeah? Yeah, I made a little rectangle. OK, so let's make it move, yeah? So in order to make it move, we have to draw it over and over again in a new place. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to do the old school type of doing it with set interval, right? Obviously, you can use request animation frame if you're all fancy. Um, 1,000 divided by 50. Let's do 50 frames a second, right? So this uh, now runs 1,000 divided by 50 milliseconds every time. So now if I declare a function called loop, oh, man, I've totally forgotten JavaScript. I've been doing C++ all week. Um, and then I was doing processing last week. It's, 
Pretty insane. Right, so let's make a variable x, set it to 0, so then we can draw this rectangle at x. Well, in fact, let's start it at 100, eh? And then I can add 1 to x here. And then you'll see like, the canvas is persistent, right? So if I draw a square and then draw it the next time in a new place, it's just going to leave the old one behind. We're not making rectangles, we're just drawing them. So we have to clear the canvas before we draw everything again. Right, so I'm just going to draw it the entire width and entire height. There you go. Yeah? We made a particle. <laughs> yeah? So let's actually make a particle. Let's um, make an object P. We'll make a dynamic object. You've done this in JavaScript. Are you, are you programmers? Let's see if you're a programmer. OK, that's most of you. OK, that's good. I can go quite fast then, I guess. The others amongst you, just good luck. Um, <laughs> right, so now I can do x and y, and I can add 1 to x. I can add 1 to y. Oh, nothing. What have I done wrong? Oh, you know what? It's because it's, uh, yeah, you know. It's a property now, isn't it? <laughs> How silly. All right. There you go. Yeah, so now it's a particle object. Let's give it, well, let's start it in the middle of the screen. Yeah, you know what I'm doing. I'm just setting its x position to the width divided by 2 and the y position to the height divided by 2. So now it starts in the middle. Let's give it, let's give it a velocity property. Yeah? So at the moment, we're just adding 1 every time. Now let's give it a velocity so we can change the, the, that variable to whatever we want. So an x velocity of 4, y velocity, let's be imaginative, 3, I don't know. So then down here, instead of just incrementing x and y, we do p dot vel x and p dot vel y. If you see a mistake, let me know. Oh, yeah, look. <laughs> yeah, I was just testing you. I really do that differently every single time, so no wonder I'm confused. <laughs> It's pretty scary doing live coding, as I say. Right, there you go, right? So, so now I can change that velocity. I can even give it a negative number so it goes the other direction, yeah? Uh, but I can actually make a random velocity. Um, Math.random, what does that return? Does anyone know? Zero to one. How do I make that zero to 10? Times it by 10. How do I make it minus five to plus five? Subtract 5. There you go. Either, actually, I have got a function down here that does it for me. Uh, so I might as well just use that. But I just wanted to show you, right, that I could do the maths if I really wanted to. <laughs> uh, random minus 5, 5. Right, so now, every time we run it, it should have a different velocity. Yeah? That's pretty cool. So there we are, a particle. OK, so now particles aren't particularly fun by themselves. They're only fun when you've got a whole load of them, right? So let's make a whole load of them. Before we make a whole load of them, we have to have something to put them in, an array. Oh, I almost forgot how to make an array in JavaScript then. <laughs> it's like, all right, so now we've got that array. Instead of making that particle at once at the beginning, I'm going to make the particle every frame and then push it onto the end of that array. Now, instead of like drawing and updating just one particle, I'm going to make a for loop and go through all of the particles. It's length, isn't it, in JavaScript? <laughs> Size in it in C++. Uh, there we are. Uh, one thing missing is that I have to set P. Probably shouldn't declare it again, but whatever. So I'm pulling the particle P out of the array and drawing and updating that particle. It should hopefully do all of them. Let's have a look. Oh, particles. Where's particle? Oh, there you go. Guys, come on. You could have seen that. There you go. Yeah? Like, it's cool, isn't it, when you let the computer do all the hard work? Um, I can also give it a size if I want. Yeah? Because then if I set the size as a property, 
then I can actually make it shrink, right? P dots. I see, I hear that beep in the background. That is um, the viewer. Whenever a new player comes, it beeps. So in case you're wondering, that's what's going on there. Um, so yeah, size. Now I've got a size, I can actually make the size shrink a bit by multiplying it by a number close to one every time. So now I get a little bit smaller every time. Yeah, pretty fun. I can add gravity just by adding something to the y velocity. I don't know, 0.5 maybe. Yeah, pretty easy, isn't it? So that's how kind of easy. Well, let's make let's make them all different colours. Yeah, yeah. Should we do different colours? I can tell you're excited. Um, I'm not going to do colours. It's too hard. I'm running out of time. Um, but I've got, here's one I prepared earlier, which is the best particle effect in the world ever, uh, except it's, it's not finished yet. It's only part of the way to it. Here's the start of it. It's basically the same code for updating the particles, but we're using a bitmap to draw the particle. It's this sort of glowy thing. Now, you can see that it's got a black outline around it, and they're all covering up all the other particles. Now, a, a super cool tip when you're doing graphics programming is to use something called additive blending. Like in Photoshop, if you've blended, you set the blend mode to add or lighter, I think, I'm not sure what it is, um, all the dark things disappear. So the layers you add on top only make things lighter, not darker. If you do that in JavaScript uh, with the composite operation, global composite operation in the canvas, uh, which makes it additive. And you can see how that all burns out. And that is like, once you start using additive blending in your projects, everything's going to be additive blended. I think every single thing in uh, Pixel Pyros is additive blended. I don't think there's a normal uh, overlay uh, setting in that entire program, except maybe the UI. I don't know. Right, um, so what have I got left to do? Um, right, I'm going to do a demo, yeah? So I just did something in New York. I didn't myself but I set something up there. And it is, I've been working on music projects. Um, I want to do some more music projects. I'm thinking about doing a laser music project where, the, obviously with lasers, <laughs> why wouldn't I do lasers with my music project? Music and lasers, it's like, that's all you need, right? Um, so on the way to that, I, I started working with uh, Ableton Live and motion detection. So this is for Smashing Conference in New York, which just started uh, it was, it was yesterday and today. So this was the opening. Uh, and my collaborator, Val, who worked with me on this and the other Smashing Conference intro, um, presented it for me. But the idea is, is that everyone in the audience has glow sticks, right? And um, I don't know if you can see here, but each channel, uh, there's four channels. There, that, like that channel there is the drums. So everyone sits, like, and this, you can just about see in the background, see those spots of light? That's the audience. So the camera's pointing at the audience, and uh, they can see themselves with their glow sticks. And everyone sat in this channel runs the drums. Everyone sat in this channel runs the bass. Everyone in this runs the synth, and everyone this channel runs the guitar. And there's several patterns for each instrument. Like this bottom pattern is just a holding pattern with nothing in it. First one is a little bit of drums and then a bit more drums until the very top. It's like full on drums. And you've got that for all of the different parts. And this is just a bit of video that someone in the audience took, but I thought I could show you it anyway. Let's have a look. Also, the music is like 80s music. All right, it just, I don't know, it just had to be 80s music. so sick of this music now. <laughs> so you can see in a minute they'll stop waving so hard and the lines come down and then the patterns change. So I thought maybe you guys could try it out, yeah? 
What do you think? Do you want to have a go? OK, well, I've got my camera here. <laughs> Might take a bit to line it up. Like the guys in New York shouldn't get all the fun, should they? <laughs> We're cool in England as well, aren't we? Um, right, I better just make sure everything's set up because it controls um, the Ableton Live software in the background. I probably should close Chrome because there's all these canvas experiments running. Look at that, look, it's so beautiful. Anyway, closing Chrome. Um, Here's Ableton, that seems to be set up well. Let's run my app. Motion, there it is. Look, there's you guys. Yeah, right, so if you just wave your arms around a little bit. There you go, so you can see it's picking up the motion. Let me just adjust it a bit. Yeah, so everyone in the back has a go as well. Right, there you go. Right, so I actually have to calibrate it. So, um, if you all do, if you all wave as much as you possibly can right now, right? go cr absolutely crazy, more and more, and in the front, in the front row, you, you guys, come on, everyone, that's it, right, more on the base, okay, you ready? There you go, right, so I've set the maximum level now, right, so now you all must like be totally still, say still, all right, so that's, that's the minimum level, okay, so I think we might be ready to go, I'm just going to mute a few things, like we've got the drums. Let's start with the drums. Okay, so people on this side control the drums. Let's just take it to the first number one. Let's see if we can get to number one. Oh, hang on. Have I, oh, I, oh, yeah, sorry. It's these guys. So I'm seeing it like the right way around. Sorry. You guys over here. Like, oh, there you go. You're on pattern one. Let's take it to number two. So every two bars it changes, yeah? So wherever the white line is. And let's take it to three, come on. Take it to three in time for the next. Stop, stop, stop. That's it. There you go. All right, so now take it all the way up to four. More, 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 more. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Here it comes. Yeah. So that's like a full on drums. That's pretty cool, isn't it? All right, okay, let's try bass. All right, so let's, let's go for it. Pattern number one. A bit more. All right, it's going to change. There you go. Take it to number two, stay on two until it changes. It gets good on three and four, I tell you, right? Let's take it to three. Four's my favorite, because it's, oh. Oh yeah, we're getting funky now. Okay, let's take it to four. Four's the most awesome ever. More, more, come on. Let's take it to four. Yeah? Yeah, now we're talking. Okay, let's try the synth. Okay, number one. Let's take, let's take it to number one on the synth, people. Stop. Like, that's proper 80 sound, isn't it? Let's take it to number two. Yeah. Come on, wait to three. Come on, let's take it to three. It's going to change in a bit. Here we are. Right, let's take it to four. Whoa! Okay, that's cool. That's the synth. Right, let's try the guitar then. Uh, right, where is it? It's you, isn't it? Oh, so confusing. Because obviously I have to mirror it, right? Oh, number pattern one is great on the guitar. Let's take it to two. Oh, yeah. Yeah? I think you guys are ready. Are you ready for a performance? Yeah? All right, okay, stop, stop, stop. Okay, here we go. Right, let's take it down to zero. You guys are the band. I'm going to leave it to you for a bit. Let's see what happens.
Should we do a big finish, yeah? Let's go for a big finish, everyone. Let's bring it right up to the top. Keep going, keep going. Yeah, keep going. Yeah, let's do four more bars. Yeah, let's keep going, just a couple more. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that was fun, wasn't it? Was, you guys are great. You should have you thought about a career in music? Maybe. All right, okay. Um, man, I'm so full of shit. Okay. Um, so I thought, you know, because I, I do like professional speaking and stuff now, and I've noticed that like proper speakers. They tend to end with like advice stuff, right? So I thought maybe I'd give that a try. I don't know. I'm just going to skip past these slides. Uh, oh, yeah, right. So my advice learn new stuff. Yeah? It's pretty good, isn't it? So I've, I've, been, saying, I've been saying learn new stuff a lot in my talks. Um, now, my first job was programming the, uh, the Commodore CD TV and Amiga CD. That was a bad time to get into Commodore Amiga programming because they were just basically fucked it up so badly that after Amiga CD was their last ditch attempt to save themselves. There's one out there, right? Just look at the controller. It's rubbish, right? So that went bust and all my skills went down the toilet. So I joined a band for a few years and then I learned uh, to make websites. Actually, that's still reasonably you know, so this was like the 90s. I could make websites and do JavaScript. But obviously, no one was really doing that then. It wasn't very cool. So I, so I learned Director instead, which obviously was very cool. Multimedia, it was called in those days. Um, Director went to shit as well, didn't it, right? Uh, so I learned, I learned a really amazing technology that was sure to stand me, uh, stand the test of time and keep me going for the rest of my career. I learned to program Flash. Uh, so. <laughs> That obviously didn't go so well. So it was quite amusing when the whole Flash thing was going south that, you know, obviously all these people were freaking out. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. What am I going to do? I'm not learning JavaScript. They don't even have types. It's like, I was just like, chill out, guys. This happens, right? I've, I've seen it all before. Uh, I, I've been through the, the director wars and the... <laughs> no. um, I remember when it was all fields. Um, and, and so, yeah. I found that to that audience around that time, I was doing loads of cool JavaScript stuff. And I was saying, guys, learn new stuff. I love learning new stuff. This is what I was saying. I love learning new stuff. This is what I was saying. It was during one of my talks, and I just realized as I was saying it, I was lying, right? I was totally lying. Learning new stuff is horrible. I hate learning new stuff. <laughs> uh, learning new stuff just makes you feel like an idiot, right? It's like, oh my God, why isn't it working? I so totally don't understand. Um, but then, of course, like after a while, you realize that you're the only one learning new stuff. And so, like, you're, even though you're, it's really hard, like all of your friends and stuff, you're better than them, right? And you've actually done something. And it's like, wow, look, I've co it's cool. So, actually, I love having learned new stuff. <laughs> yeah, because that's, that's really cool. So, and it's, it's, yeah, it's hard, you feel like an idiot. I don't know why I do it, I'm a masochist maybe, but it's totally worth it at the end. And now, you know, I work in processing and Arduino, all the Lunar Trails plotter is all Arduino. The laser stuff is all C++ and open frameworks. I still do JavaScript. It's brilliant, you know, swip, swip, swapping between all these platforms is really good for your brain and it's really fun. It's totally difficult at first. Like you saw me trying to type on the Commodore 64 and then JavaScript, it's been a little while, but it's good for your brain. Anything that's good for your brain is really good. Right, next bit of new advice. Ah, oh, finish your projects. Right, who here has ever embarked on a project, a personal project outside of work? Who's, who's embarked on a project? Okay, keep your hand up if you finished it. Oh, a couple of years. <laughs> I saw someone going like that. You didn't finish it. You did not, that's, that's not finished, right? Um, no one finishes their projects. So 
even if you finish it, even if it's rubbish, you're still like way ahead of most other people. And uh, the reason most people don't finish their projects is because about halfway through your project, you've solved all the fun challenges. And in fact, it's like 90% of the way, you're like, oh, I've nearly finished like this guy. Yeah, I've nearly finished. You're 90% of the way through your project. But the, the, you know, the, the, the great lie about personal projects is that it feels like 90%, but really you've got another 90% coming, right? Because finishing projects, and it's all the boring bits, and by that point it's just work, and it's really depressing. But you've got to get through it, because by the end you put it on the internet, and if you do enough projects like that, then people start to see it and like it. And then if you can finish projects doing things that you really like, then people start asking you to do those things for them and then you don't have to do what other people say anymore. <laughs> it's brilliant. Um, oh yeah, there you go. It's maths. <laughs> oh, this is another thing that I've learned. There's no such thing as natural talent. I, people, you know, you see people, like a classic example is Robert Hodgin, who's a brilliant, brilliant computer artist. Check out his work, Flight 404. Some of you have probably seen him. He's done a few conferences and stuff. Um, he's absolutely brilliant and you see his work and you just think, oh my God, he's so talented. And I guess he is talented. He's also a really nice guy. Um, but the thing that he said, he said to me, I interviewed him for my podcast a couple of years ago, check it out. Um, but he said to me, I get really shocked when people come up to me after conferences and say, I wish I could be as good a programmer as you. He said, because he doesn't feel like he's a really good programmer. He started as a sculptor and he just figured out programming. Um, he was making flash banners. He didn't want to make flash banners anymore, so he learned processing. Um, but he just works really hard. Nothing is easy for him. He is always working and refining and learning. Uh, that's all it is. It's just the amount of work that he's put in has got him to this level. And I think, you know, I might have a, a slight aptitude, maybe because of, I've always loved computers, but I think actually my most important skill is my attitude towards it. You know, my ability to focus on something, to finish my projects, you know, to just keep going and keep learning new things and try different things. Definitely my career has been a kind of random riding of, uh, what's, I'm trying to find a surfing metaphor. I should probably just give up. I'm not cool enough to do surfing metaphors. Um, but yeah, it's certainly been about application and, and just work, you know. And if you work enough, then uh, your work gets better and comes out good, I think. I wonder if I've got any more advice. No, I don't. That's it. Um, any questions? Oh, that was launched on you. You didn't have any chance. That was a good ending, was it? I should sort of maybe slow it down a bit. You know, if I was professional, I'd have my, my notes, my speaking. I'm just mirroring. I, d I don't see the slide until you do. I've got no idea it's, it's coming. So, yeah, did you have a question? Where you find clients who pay you to do all this? Oh, I don't have any clients. No, you don't want clients. They mess everything up. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, obviously, I'm in a very privileged posi position to be able to pretty much do my own projects. Um, so I did run a digital agency called Plugin Media who are very well known for kids digital. They still exist, but I left my own company about two or three years ago. Agency work is pretty relentless and difficult. And even the best clients, I realized that I was spending t only 10% of the work, the time doing the things that I really wanted to do. Um, I'm not sure what the other 90% was. Even with the good clients, there's still like talking to them and stuff. Um, and with the bad clients, there's like arguing with them, which takes loads of time. Uh, longer. So I'm being a bit flippant, but um, I guess my inability to want to deal with that sort of made me look for alternatives. Um, and I was starting to do conference speaking and that's, uh, my profile started rising a little bit, which I realized was very um, empowering. So I could, I realized then that if I left my company, I could do a bit of training just put together little workshops every few months. And I know it would be a struggle, but I thought I could just about survive on that. So you have to sort of take that leap at one point. You have to say, this is going to be a struggle. I'm going to have to scale everything down. 
But the benefit of that was that I could spend most of my time doing the projects that up until that point I was doing in my spare time. Uh, the open source projects I contributed to, my blog, which I wrote, you know, all of those things that I was doing in my spare time was killing me, I could now do all the time, even though I was struggling a bit. Of course, then it, like Flash died, right? So my workshop stopped selling. But I did some JavaScript, and everyone, no one in JavaScript had really been doing that graphics-y stuff. So I, I was lucky, you know, I'm really lucky. My creative JS workshops took off, um, and that, that became quite successful. All along this time, I was doing my own art projects, not really earning any money, just about covering the costs. Like the first Pixel Pyros, I got 10,000 pounds from the Arts Council. I think I spent like 12,000, um, and then I got a bit of extra money from the Digital Festival, and I, I didn't earn any money from it. Next year, I applied for a 50,000 pound Arts Council grant, which we got, and we got more money from the events as well. So I earned some money for that. And so it was like last year was the first year that I started earning money from these crazy projects that I just decided to do. Lunar Trails as well was a commission with the Dublin Science Gallery. Again, I've probably invested way too much money in the stuff, and the engineering and the equipment. Um, but this year it's gone in exhibitions around the world. It's just come back from France. So that's starting to earn me money as well. So I'd say now at the moment, speaking at conferences and workshops are like half of my income and the rest is from the art project. So I consider myself very, very lucky, but then I also think I probably wouldn't have got into this position if I wasn't totally intolerant of the other way of doing it. <laughs> yeah, because it's really hard to leave that work situation. It's a, it takes a real leap of faith. Yeah? Yes? What inspires me to make the content I make? Um, I mean, throughout my life, I've been inspired and motivated by the technical things that I know how to do. Um, so it's like, now I know how to use a laser, I'm always thinking, oh, I could do that with a laser, I could do it, you know, you might have, I'm probably a bit boring about lasers, I do other stuff as well. I've been playing with LED light strips, right? Fully addressable, five meter long LED light strips, so easy to work with, they're so easy, just plug them into an Arduino. Then you start thinking, oh, that's cool, what can I do with that? You know, like my friend Jason I mentioned earlier, he's got a brilliant 1D Pong game with a five meter LED strip with foot switches on either end, and you've just got a stamp on it when the light comes to you. And if you miss it, it, it goes past. And it's just brilliant, simple idea, and I suspect he came up with that idea just because he knew how to control an LED light strip. Um, I'm always being asked, like, what's the point of my art? <laughs> I really hate that question because I really don't enjoy analyzing it very much. Um, but I suppose it's good for me to analyze it a bit as well. My motivation is bringing enjoyment and fun experiences to people, um, which is its sort of own kind of reward, I think. And it can be quite a profound experience for the people participating, but it's not traditionally challenging or deep like a lot of art is. But then with all my projects, it's entirely controlled by the people that are participating in it. Like just then with that music project, sure, I pre-programmed the patterns, but nothing would happen if you guys didn't do anything. Same with the fireworks, same with my upcoming music projects, which are even gonna be more like uh, musical instruments that the public use. So my work is all about empowering the public to make these projects that really would be nothing without them. But yeah, I'm not very good at explaining the depth to my work, I try and avoid it. I'm an imposter in the art world. Would you say one of your inspired Yeah, I think so, you know, and, and just the first, my first early prototype of Pixel Pyros was in Flash six or seven years ago. Uh, it was a very simple one projector, but just to be able to bring the computer outdoors, <laughs> you know, and do all the same interactions that I was doing in Flash on the internet for kids. Millions of people were playing my games on the internet, but it was still magical to see 500 people in a space 
creating an event happening because of the code that I'd written. It's kind of, that's really fun. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I try to do that a little bit. Um, I should do it more. There are other open frameworks artists that are much better at turning their projects into libraries that other people can use. I still don't feel entirely natural with C++, so I still don't quite feel, I haven't quite got that down yet. Um, but because I do have a lot of experience programming, I do try to make things sort of modular, kind of well programmed. Of course, the nearer the deadline it gets, the more crazy it gets. Um, but yeah, I, sh I should do that more. I mean, at least they're reusable kind of, for me, could be better, could do more in that regard for sure, but of course, Every time I use that laser code, it gets a bit more refined. Um, so hopefully it's, it's going to happen. But I should really spend time after a project going, oh, I'm just going to finish this off. But yeah, it's always, yeah, I'd like to, but I don't enough. Yeah? Any more? Are we done? Yeah, we're going to go and play some retro games. <laughs> yeah, cool. All right, well, it's been great. Thanks very much. <laughs>